Would you open the Word of God tonight to the book of Acts? To the book of Acts. We're going to, I don't know if we'll finish tonight, but uh, probably we want to look at the fourth price for Pentecost. We've looked at three and we found them all in chapter one. And I don't want to be redundant, but chapter two is when Pentecost hit. Everybody likes Pentecost. Everybody wants Pentecost. Everybody wants to see that Pentecostal power. Everybody wants, at least I hope everybody in this church desires to see 3,000 people saved. We live in a day where we need, we, got, we need a move of God. That's our only hope. I started these series of messages preaching out of 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, the Bible says, then will I hear from heaven. Then and only then. So I tried to emphasize the power that Christians have. And we want to hear from heaven. Our greatest hope, our, our greatest, our only hope is being able to hear from heaven. We need a move of God. We need the fire of God. And we've been looking in the book of Acts because chapter 2, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost, verse 1, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So here's this sound from heaven. They heard from heaven, and of course we know that it was the Holy Spirit of God, everyone there. They were there because they had obeyed the Lord. God told them to stay in Jerusalem. They were going to be endued with the Spirit of God. Remember he told him when that which when I leave, that which promised the, the comforter will come, the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. And we understand the power that took place. Peter stood up with great power and preached the word of God. Everybody there heard the gospel in their own language. And I've, I've spent time and time after that because we live in a day where people are so confused about tongues. But if you will take Acts chapter 2 and do a study on tongues, it's nothing but a language that somebody that was there, it was their language, it might not have been your language. But it was a language that somebody understood. And if you'll read the passage, he did not speak in all those languages. The Bible says everyone there heard in their own language. So that was the miracle, but the tongues wasn't the thing to make a big deal about. Why did God give the gift of tongues on this particular occasion that everybody could hear in their own language? Because the big deal is they needed to hear the gospel. The gospel's always the big deal. It's not the tongues. The tongues was a tool to get the truth to the masses. So we see at the end of that, after Peter preached, man, I'm telling you right now, the Bible said the Holy Spirit, the Bible used this word, pricked them in their heart. That's, that is conviction. You ever been convicted? I'm going to be honest with you, I've never enjoyed conviction, but I'm thankful for it. Because you know why? God loves us too much to let us go. And I'm just going to say this tonight, and I'm going to deal with this subject a little bit tonight, but I want to tell you something, if you are a Christian and you've not been convicted, and you're, you don't understand what conviction is, then I'd be concerned. Because I can promise you this, the Holy Spirit of God will convict us. The Bible says He'll guide us into all truth. So, we see in chapter 1, verse, or chapter 2, verse 37, said they were pricked in their heart. Then verse 38, the Bible said, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. And then we understand 3,000 souls were saved and added to the church in verse 41. So we want to see the fire, don't we? We want to see revival. We want to see Pentecost. But I've been preaching on chapter 1 preceded chapter 2. And if the things didn't take place in chapter 1, chapter 2 would have never happened. Now there was some human responsibility. There was some prices to pay in chapter 1 before chapter 2. Before the fire came... The people of God had to pay some price. If my people will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven. So the human responsibility is the same. time. Every time we've seen God desiring to do something, there is human responsibility in that. And we see in Acts chapter 1, we've dealt with the first three. Number one, there had to be obedience. They obeyed. Verse 12, they stayed in Jerusalem. 
They could have went anywhere else and missed the power of God. They could have went somewhere else and said, I tell you right now, God don't know what he thinks. I need to go somewhere else. We've been here in Jerusalem. He said, no, you stay in Jerusalem. Verse 12, they stayed. They obeyed. So I talked about obedience as a price that God's people has to pay. We should be obedient to the Lord. God blesses obedience. Then we looked all through the chapter. We've seen in chapter 1, verse number 14, the Bible says these all continue with what? One accord. Chapter 2, verse 1, one accord. You keep going through the whole early church of the book. The Bible says they're in one accord, one accord, one accord. Here's the second price. We must be in unity. The people of God's got to be in unity. We've got to be unified under the goal and the gospel. We've got to be unified under one purpose, and that's to see the law saved. That is to see God's work get done in this world, and that is a unifying purpose. So we talked about unity. And then third, I think, is the greatest price that all of us need to really deal with. We dealt with that on Sunday night. We dealt with prayer. They were in one accord doing what? Praying. They were praying. All through the book of Acts, you'll see the early church, they prayed. They prayed for something special. We know that every great revival was preceded in prayer. History is silent about revival where no prayer preceded it. So we talked about prayer. That's why we want to have a prayer. We've been emphasizing prayer. We want to emphasize our special prayer Saturday on the 27th. We want to emphasize the men's prayer breakfast this Saturday. Now, I will not be in attendance there with you physically, but I promise you I'll be praying with you on Saturday morning. And uh, next Saturday or the 27th, we're going to meet here at 11 o'clock. We'll spread out. I don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but I'd like to do it kind of under the the guise of how they did it in 18. 47, 48, uh, 18, actually it was in 1858 uh, at the great Fulton Street prayer meeting up in New York. And so we want to pray. That's a price. Now look at the fourth one. Now this one is a little interesting and someone might say, man, why did they spend so much time in the latter part of chapter 1 dealing with this subject? I think it's powerful. Would you look at me, look with me in verse 15. So we've dealt with obedience, we've dealt with unity, and we've dealt with prayer. Now look what, they, what God spends the last part of the chapter. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. That's powerful. Which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas. Now he's talking about Judas. The one that betrayed Jesus. Now there's 11 disciples there. One is gone. One is dead. One was a fake. Judas was a fake. Notice what the Bible says about him. Before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. He'd been with Jesus three and a half years. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Now he's speaking here of how he killed himself. He hung himself, Jews. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem insomuch as that field is in, called in their proper tongue, al Sadama, that it is to say the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Now notice this. Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time. I want you to mark that little word, all the time. That the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, and to the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Notice this, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. A brand new disciple. 
Here's the fourth price. Are y'all ready? The right kind of leadership. Now, I want everybody to listen to me, listen to me well. I didn't dial up this weather. And I hope everybody is watching online tonight. If you're a church worker, a children's worker, if you hold any influence in this church, this message is for all of us. Because I think we have belittled this too much in this day. But I want you to know something. It was a price that had to be paid before the fire of God came down. They wanted to be very careful who they chose to be a leader. I'm not talking about in the world. By the way, we ought to be very careful who we vote for to be leaders. But I want to be honest with you. It's even that much more important that the leadership in the church is what it should be. And I want you to know something. We've been talking from Acts 1 about how to stay on the air and how to be right with God and how to have the fire to fall and be in tune with the Lord. And we want God to do something great. But listen to me, the price of Pentecost, we see in chapter 1, all of these things took place. Why did he spend most of the time of this chapter preceding Pentecost dealing with choosing and being the right kind of leader? It's important, church. Great churches don't just happen by accident. They're not determined by location. They're not determined by facilities. Great churches occur when God's people become willing to pay the price. And one of the prices that had to be paid is Matthew had to be the right kind of person in the right fellowship and committed to the work of God to be chosen to be a disciple. Here's what he said, to take part in this ministry. Do you understand how powerful that is when you say that you're taking part of the ministry of God through the Tiftonia Baptist Church? That is no little thing. I want you to know something. That's one reason why we're falling today. Our world is falling. It's crumbling because too many Christians have belittled the idea of taking part in God's work through a local church. And I want you to know something. Great churches are made up of great families and great individuals and great families have traits of greatness and we find three of them here earlier that we talked about, obedience, unity, and prayer. But the fourth one is leadership. Churches, according to Acts chapter 1, we understand that this was one of the things that had to be taken care of. A price had to be paid. Somebody had to take the position and the place and the leadership role of Judas. Did not this statement come probably from the Chattanooga area? Everything rises and falls on what? Judas turned out to be a devil. He forsook the Lord. He committed suicide. There was only 11. They're all here. On the night, the day, the time, right here before Pentecost, they're all there. They're all listed. Verse 13. Judas is gone. He's dead. He's killed himself. He forsook the Lord. So today, consider this question. What kind of leader were they looking for? What kind of leader were they looking for here? Were they concerned about it? Absolutely they were concerned about it. I believe there's reasons for that. But what kind of leader were they looking for? And what kind of leaders do we need to look at to have order, to have power, and have the blessings of God in our churches? I think it's relevant. If everything rises and falls on leadership, God help us. Now, when I say leaders, I know what most people think. Well, that means the pastor. No, I'm not. I want to get you all out of that mindset because listen to me. Yes, God's called me to be the pastor, but before I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian. I'm a full-time Christian. You're a full-time Christian. You're not a part-time Christian. You should be a full-time Christian. And by the way, when I read the Word of God, I don't really see a lot of these people that have titles. They're just Christians. They're serving the Lord. A leader, a leader is just simply this, a servant. Who was the greatest servant leader ever? Jesus Christ. So when I say leaders, don't think we're just talking about pastors or church staff. Listen, I'm talking about deacons tonight. I'm talking about deacons' wives tonight. I'm talking about Sunday school teachers tonight. I'm talking about bus workers tonight. 
I'm talking about children's church workers tonight. I'm talking about every church member that has any influence and you're participating in anything in this church. I want you to know something. You're a leader. Matters. So Jesus said servants are the true leaders. Servants. who Servants. What's a servant? Someone that gets out of the boat and is willing to get their hands dirty. They're willing to roll up their sleeves and get their old dirty towel and clean some dirty feet. Was it not Jesus Christ that served his own disciples? And old Peter, you know, said, Oh, Lord, I'll have, hey, you won't have no part in that with me. He said, You're not going to wash my old feet. And the Lord Jesus looked at him and said, If you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. See, Peter did not understand at that point what the power of servant leadership was. Jesus is our greatest example of a servant leadership. What does that mean? It means a servant leadership is trusting. They're being open. They're offering help. They're caring. They're caring and being willing to be vulnerable, to help others. Servant leadership. I want to read something to you because we live in a day where I'm afraid this younger generation has no idea what the cost of leadership means, what the responsibility. Everybody wants a title. They want a title without any of the responsibility, but you can't have the title. And you're not going to be effective in your leadership role unless you understand there's responsibilities to that leadership. Matthias knew what he was signing up for. He knew. And by the way, when that lot fell, that meant the Lord picked him. They were so concerned about it. They said, Lord, we need your help. We've done serve with a fake all these years. We know we can, be, we can be blinded, but we need you to help us pick the right leader. And I believe they got the right one. These 12 men turned the world upside down for God. But I, I, I wrote this down. Actually, I printed it out, but there's a man by the name of... Um, and I just went blank. He was the, uh, the commander of the Easy Company of 101st Airborne. Can't even think of his name. He was from up Pennsylvania. Somebody help me. Uh, Dick Winters. Thank you, Dad. Dick Winters. I would ask you to read anything about him, man. He was a great guy, great, you know. But here he wrote a book. He just had principles on leadership. And he was one of the greatest leaders at the 101st. And he was just a common a uh, man before the war, he, was, he enlisted to fight in the war, but he was not a military man. Everything he learned was once he was recruited or once he joined up to fight because they bombed Pearl Harbor. But I want you to just notice what he understood about leadership in the 40s. Here's what he said. Strive to be a leader of character, competence, and courage. I love this. He said, if you want to be a leader, lead from the front. You can't lead from the back. And you can't lead in a foxhole. And you can't lead if you're not present. And here's what he said. Lead from the front, and I love this. Say, follow me, and then lead the way. Think about that. Follow me. Not you go on. No, no, no. Follow me and then lead the way. Every teacher here is leading the way. They're not expecting their students to do something they're not willing to do themselves. This is just practical leadership that everybody understood in the 40s. Then develop your team. If you know your people are fair in setting realistic goals and expectations, lead by example and you will develop teamwork. Number number four, delegate responsibility to your subordinates and let them do their job. Number five, anticipate problems and prepare to overcome obstacles. Don't wait until you get to the top of the ridge, then make up your mind. I love this one. Remain humble. Don't worry about who receives the credit. Never let power or authority go to your head. That's powerful, isn't it? Take a moment of self-reflection. This is powerful too. Because it's so easy for all of us to look at everybody else. Take a moment of self-reflection. Look at yourself in the mirror every night and ask yourself, did I do my best? That's humbling, isn't it? The key to a successful leader is to earn respect. Not because of rank or position, but because you're a leader of character. Number 10, hang tough. 
Never, ever, ever, never give up. Those are pretty good practical principles about leadership. And I want to write down a few things here. I want you to take note of a few things tonight. Qualities of a biblical leader based on this text. Look at the first one. Number one, and this is simple, and you might say, well, Pastor, that's elementary, but it's very important because I think it's very important in, so, in, in context of this passage. Leaders must be genuinely converted. They must be genuinely saved. Now, you say, Pastor, why are you bringing that up? Well, one of them had served for three and a half years, and he wasn't. None of, none of them sniffed him out. He was pretty good at his craft. He handled the money, by the way. Somebody say, man, y'all got awful quiet on me. He must have been the most trustworthy one there because every time you mentioned Judas, he had the money bag. But yet he was the one. And here's what's amazing. If you read account, Brother Jim and I was talking about it today. Jesus told the disciples who was going to betray him. And they still missed it. He was the one that sopped the bread right after he said, the one that takes sop right after me. He did it. And the disciples still missed it. Not Judas. Now you can say, Pastor, you're trying to get people to doubt their salvation. Not at all. Just make sure you got him. Make sure you know him. And let me just say this, if you met him, you know it. You don't meet Jesus Christ and not be able to talk to him about him. I can promise you when you meet Jesus, you'll never forget him. So precious is Jesus, my Savior, my King. I mean, having a relationship with him. But the Bible said one of the things that they wanted to make sure, if you look there in verse 22, they said, we want to make sure we get one that's a witness of the resurrection. What do they mean? You've got to be a witness of the resurrection. You shall be witnesses of me. What's that mean? You shall be witness. Most people think, all right now, I've got to be a witness of what the Lord's know. The Bible says you first have to be a witness. You have to know him before you can talk about him. You have to know the resurrection. You have to be a witness of the resurrection that you know Christ your Savior. You understand? It's a noun, then it turns into a verb. You have to have the noun right. You have to know him. You have to have the witness. You've got to know Jesus Christ, your Savior, before you can go out and witness for him. Does that make sense? That's simple, isn't it? That's what they were concerned about. We want someone that is a witness of the resurrection. We want them to be saved so they can take part in this ministry. The 11 remaining are being very careful because they got burned by Judas. Could you imagine the shock? Because they're human just like us. Could you imagine the shock when they realize it's Judas? I'm going to be honest with you. I think we're going to get to heaven if we weren't perfect up there because we are going to be. And the Bible says we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. But I think there's going to be a lot of shock there too. Wow. Man, they talked it. They had the vision. and You know, they had the, they had the image. Look at me. I wouldn't care about my image. I'd make sure I had him. And I'd say this. I know I've heard a lot of people say, well, I just couldn't get saved because of my pride. Pride ain't worth going to hell for. All I want to say to you tonight is make sure you know him. You'll never be the right kind of leader. You'll never be the right kind of leader without knowing Christ as your Savior. You can be any leader at any level, but you still must be born again. It's one thing to profess Christ. It's another to possess Christ. Claim his name. It's one thing to claim his name. It's another thing to submit to his person. Leaders must genuinely be converted. They must genuinely be saved. Now look, I'm not saying this to to make you doubt anything tonight. I am assured of it. You know what? I nailed that down many, many years ago. I nailed it down like a stake down in the ground 100 miles deep. I had to say to the devil one night, I said, look here, devil, you're going to quit doubt. You're going to quit making me doubt. I had even talked to myself and say, self, you're going to have to quit doubting this thing. And one night, I've told you this before, but I just laid there in bed. I said, Lord, I'm telling you with all my heart, I've trusted you as my, as my Savior. And if I go to hell, it's your fault. I don't know anything else to do. That's complete faith, friend. Nail it down tonight. If you don't have it nailed down, you need to make tonight your night that it's nailed down. Amen. Leaders must 
be converted. Number two, quickly, leaders must have conviction. And I'll probably stop right here because this is powerful. I should let y'all home early tonight. I think we're just going to get rain. But I want you to notice, leaders must have conviction. I want you to look at verse 15 and 16. These verses are powerful as I study them. And we want to have prayer for Miss Vicky tonight. Verse 15, I want you to notice this. And in those days, this is amazing to me. And I've never picked up on this till I'll study this passage. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. What scripture? That's interesting. Which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David. So now it goes back to either the Psalms or something David said. And it happens to be in the book of Psalms. And we're going to turn there in a minute. By the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas. Which was God to them that took Jesus. Now here's what I want you to, I want you to notice tonight. Three quick things. Number one, a leader must be convicted in their heart that the Bible is the sole authority. The authority of God's word. It is absolutely authoritative. Notice this. He's talking about Judas' betrayal. Do you know that Judas' betrayal was prophesied hundreds of years before it actually happened? It must needs be fulfilled. That's what Peter stood up and said here in Acts chapter 2. This scripture must be fulfilled. In other words, he's talking about the betrayal of Judas. Now, how did nobody know it? How was the disciples blinded? Even when he dipped the sop right after Jesus, he said, there's going to be one of you that's going to offend me. One of you are going to betray me. Every leader must believe that the Bible is 100% correct in every little jot and tittle. God's Word is the authority to all of our faith and practice. My life, my physical being is depending upon this book right here. If I do not believe that salvation is of Jesus Christ, I've given my whole life to something that's a fake. I've wasted my life. Right? If this book isn't true, I've wasted my whole life up to this point. No, I believe it. It's complete authority. I believe whether I understand it or not, every leader in this church should know that the Word of God is the answer to all of our problems. We know God's Word is true. It's complete authority of our lives. It should be the complete authority of our church. It's why we function the way we function. There's no such thing as a growing, soul-winning church that is not also a Bible-believing church. You believe the Word of God? The bottom line is not getting people into the building. You know, we want to get them in the building. We want to get them to come to church. Well, what are we going to do with them when we get them here? That's not important. I mean, getting them here is important, but what's more important? It's what we do with them once they're in the building. You know, all I've ever heard is, what y'all got for the kids? We got the Bible. I mean, they can go play ball anywhere. And Mr. Maddox, I'm glad you can play ball. And by the way, I love playing ball. I don't think I would want to play with you anymore. But I'm going to be honest. We're at, look here. We've made gods out of everything. Look at me. I'm going to tell you what is the most important thing in Maddox's life is the Word of God. Most important part of my life is the Word of God. The authority of my life is the Word of God. And so we believe that God's Word is, listen, that's what needs to be put in our life. You ever get discouraged? How many of you teachers have ever got discouraged? You've been teaching a class, Sunday school class. You've been working on the buses. You've been teaching. You've been teaching. You've been teaching. You say, oh, pastor, they're about to drive me crazy. They're not getting it. No, they're getting it. And by the way, sometimes we want ex- immediate, like, instant rice. You know, we, we put instant rice. We get instant rice in just a couple of minutes. And sometimes we think that in a child's life or an adult's life, that you know, we're going to get instant rice. Well, sometimes you're going to get instant results. But most of the time you're going to get that, you know, slow to boil rice results. But here's the wonderful thing. You're going to get the results because God's word says it will not come back void. 
God's word is the authority. We must believe that. Look here. G. Campbell Morgan, a great preacher of last century, said he was raised all of his life believing the Bible was the word of God. But he left home and the agnostics, atheists, liberals planted doubts in his mind. He got confused. He started reading as much as he could on both sides of the Bible issue. When he got done, he was more confused than ever. Now this is a preacher, G. Campbell Morgan. And he said, decided to do something different, and he just read the Bible itself. He asked God to reveal it to him in this word, and he said, when I walked out of that room, I didn't think it was the word of God. He said, I know it was the word of God. Simple. We believe in the authority of the word of God. Number two, and by the way, godly leaders must believe in the authority of God's word. Because look, we don't have a message. I don't, look here, I don't have nothing else. When a couple comes into my office, and my wife and I, and we counsel them, look, we don't have no little booklet that we get off of anybody. I'm just going to tell you, here's where we get all of our principles from. You know why? Because it works. You know why? Because he designed marriage, not man. Not Dr. Phil, not Miss Oprah, not Dr. Spock. They did not define marriage. They did not design marriage. God did. So let's just give them the truth, right? we got to stand on it, church, and we do. And thank God we are a church that believes in the Bible. How many of y'all love the Bible and believe and stand on the Bible? I'll be honest, I wouldn't be here if you didn't. Number two, the authorship of God's Word. Quickly now, authorship. Can, we got to be convicted about this. we got to make sure the authorship of God's Word. Look at verse 16. The Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake. Notice that in verse 16. Here's what's amazing, the dual authorship of the Bible. Here's what, here's just what we believe. Breath, God breathed through instruments. It's inspired of God. God's word was breathed from God. It originated from God, but he used instruments to pen it. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Forty men from different backgrounds over 1,600 years wrote 66 books which have came together as the all-time best-selling literary masterpiece with one common theme, and that one common theme was the unfolding drama of redemption by the Savior, and it was only authored by one. Who else could do it? And this book has one common hero, and it was Jesus Christ. It's only possible by there being one author overseeing the whole project. By the way, he overseen the whole project. And some of these folks always want to, you know, there's so much confusion today about stuff. And, you know, it amazes me. And I look at them and say, look, here's all I say to them. If the God can speak an, un, an absolute nothing into something, speaking it, he can keep his word perfect. And there's where the doctrine of preservation comes in. He says he will preserve his word. We have his word. You'd say, well, Pastor, how do you know? Because he's promised us he would preserve it. It's only possible by there being one author overseeing the whole project, God Almighty. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Godly leaders must believe in the authority of God's word and the authorship of God's word. Number three, and I'm going to close. I'm going to get to the good stuff Sunday. Because I think leadership's a big deal. How many of y'all think leadership's a big deal? We all see it now as a big deal in our country, right? You know, we, 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 didn't, we really don't have a, you know, we just have, you know, a, you know, we've got, you know, some challenges at the border. Challenges? Or do we have a crisis? Well, when you care more about illegals coming and taking care of the people you got, I think you've got a crisis. When you have facilities down there that's overrun and don't have enough to house everybody, I mean, I think you got a crisis. So, I mean, leadership matters, right? I can promise you this. It, it means so much more in a church. I promise you. We need revival, church. And I'm speaking to all of us. God, help us to be the right mommies, the right daddies, the right grandmas, the right grandpas, the right church members, the right Sunday school teachers, the right kind of deacons, the right kind of pastor, the right kind of children's worker, the right kind of bus worker, the right kind of nursery worker. It matters. 
Number three, the accuracy of God's word. Look at verse 16. Here's what he says. Concerning Judas. You say, well, he's not supposed to name names. He named him. If Judas have ever, would have ever bothered, he could have read about himself in the Bible. You ever thought about that? If he would have bothered to read the book of Psalms, he'd have realized, hey, I'm in there and I'm the one. There's somebody. And you know, they didn't call him by name. But I want you to know something. Psalm 41.9 says this. Here's what the Lord's talking about here. This is the prophecy that had to be fulfilled in Psalm 41.9. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, the sop, a very intimate meal, the very night that Judas knew he was going to, look, that was no ordinary night. That was a very special, intimate night. The Lord Jesus poured his heart out. I couldn't imagine being there and not the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the conviction hitting me which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Speaking of Judas. But for, Judas only, but for Judas only one passage he needed, and this was the one about himself. Now you say, Pastor, was his name mentioned? No, it wasn't mentioned. But I'm going to tell you right now, Peter read it. He would have at least realized, you know what? Somebody's going to betray the Lord. I would never want it to be me. You know what? It was him. And here's the application, just simply this. Let me tell you precisely why so many people avoid Bible preaching churches. They don't want to be confronted by the mirror of God's word because they don't want to see themselves as who they really are. Now let's let that sink in a minute. You know who I have the most struggle with in my life? It ain't y'all. It's me. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me. And you know what? Every time I read my Bible, that's illuminated in my life. I told my wife before I came here tonight, I said, oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, wretched man that I am. You know what illuminates that in my life? When I read the Holy Word of God. And I get it why a lot of people, they want to quit coming to church. I get it. I get it why they're stopping services. I get it why they have little, you know, sharing little topics and all of that. I get it because, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. Some good old-fashioned Bible truth don't always make me feel good. To be quite honest with you, it's made me feel really sad at times. But once God works in my life and deals with me, it makes me glad. But, you know, I think about this. Since I've been here, uh, we've had people leave for numerous reasons. I mean, I couldn't count the reasons why, and I wouldn't even go into all of that. But I'm going to be honest with you. I know in my ministry of 20-some years, there have been people that have just absolutely left because it's been said, you know, we don't like altar calls. We get nervous when people start responding to the Word of God. I'm going to be honest, that blows my mind that that could even make somebody nervous. Somebody say, man, are y'all with me? I mean, I, I get nervous when people don't respond. But I'm like, man, when Jesus preached, man, the Bible said they were pricked. When Peter preached in the day of Pentecost, the Bible said they were pricked in their heart. There was 3,000 people responding to the gospel. And I get it, I get it. I know sometimes truth makes it uncomfortable. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think years ago when I first came here, some older folks were here. They were concerned that I was, because I'm young, I'm no longer young. I'm 46. I got gray hair. I'm losing my hair. So I haven't heard this much anymore because now I realize I've kind of attained, you know, I'm older now. People aren't as concerned about me changing. But by the way, I'm always capable, by the way. I have no desire. But we had one particular man. He was concerned for years and years and years, years and years, years. He'd come to the deacon and say, wait a minute now, wait a minute. He's always concerned, Brother Shown, because he's afraid I was going to change something. You know, I was going to get weak. I was going to get, you know, maybe get liberal, whatever you want to call it. But I was going to change. He's going to change. Go, go to all these newfound philosophies. He's going to change. He's going to change. Well, listen to me now. Y'all hung around here about 12 years. 
and I mean this, and my wife knows it. Listen to me. I wish I could let up on some things. It would be a whole lot less stressful for me. But you know why I can't? Because I couldn't go to bed at night. The Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, would convict me. I'd be up all night and say, Mark, you're letting things go that you shouldn't let go. you got to stay right with the Word of God. you got to do right. Someone might say, well, you got to treat your children different. I can't treat my children different. You say, well, why not? you got to give them a little bit more of a break. I can't give them any more of a break than I would anybody else because I wouldn't be right. Truth is universal. I said to someone the other day, not long ago, I said, look, I don't have that luxury to change just because it might be someone in your family or my family. Listen to me. Truth has to stay truth. And I know we can do a lot of things to change around here to get a bunch of people in this building. I'm not interested in that church. I'm going to tell you what I'm interested in. I'm interested in in loving this old book right here. Loving the one that wrote it. And let's line up with it because I'll tell you this right now. I've never seen anyone be hurt by trying to do what this book says. God help us to realize the authority of this book and every leader, your whole dependence upon your life, your ministry, your influence around here is this book. God gives us the authority through his word. And they were so absolutely convinced. They said, look, this prophecy had to be fulfilled. They had, Peter had complete authority and he wanted a leader to serve alongside him and the other ten that would take part in that ministry that had the same beliefs that he had. Everything rises and falls on leadership. That was the fourth price that had to be paid. Because you know what? As soon as Matthias was picked, I got to quit. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place. Right after that leader was picked, the fire of God fell down. That's powerful.